Welcome to our uh, Tuesday afternoon edition of Table Talk. Table Talk is something new that we're doing here at CBC Alderton, especially during this time of uh, social isolation. We're trying to bring the Word of God into you in a devotional way. And I'm going to start on Tuesday afternoons teaching from New Testament epistles. Today I want to do a general introduction and probably if we have time dip into a little bit of Colossians as well. I was thinking today that, you know, we really don't, um, I don't think we have an appreciation uh, for communication in the way that older generations do. And kind of take it for granted. Doesn't mean that we don't take good advantage of the communication tools that we do have. I, I think we do. Uh, but I just don't think that it's possible for us to appreciate communication in the way, like I said, older generations do. I have here an iPhone and I have a daughter as many of you know that lives in England and I could text her or FaceTime her right now request a, a meeting with her and she'd probably pick right up and I'd be able to talk to my daughter who is five time zones away across the Atlantic and that's amazing um, but I think that does mean because of the immediacy of our communication these days we don't appreciate letters in the way that older generations would have. If I text a friend, I'm practically perturbed if I don't get a response immediately. I was thinking as, as well of uh, Linda and myself. We used to write letters during our courtship. Um, we were in different universities, so uh, we were in different cities. Uh, we wanted to communicate with each other. We did have landlines, but landlines were pretty expensive and considered a luxury for a lot of people. So we communicated by letters. We sent them weekly, and they were eagerly anticipated. By the time we got to Wednesday or Thursday, we couldn't wait to hear from each other. Uh, Linda sometimes would return from class and uh, arrive in her college, and her porter would say, Miss Weens, you've got mail. And that would put a spring in her step. Uh, my letters were pretty famous around there, I must say, because I would make the envelopes out of old calendar pictures. And uh, so, yeah, they used to get quite a bit of attention. Well, let me ask you, do you think you read the New Testament letters with the kind of um, anticipation, I guess, that the original readers would have had? Well, I think the answer is clearly no. I don't think any of us do. I don't think any of us can really put ourselves in their shoes. Uh, and again, because of the immediacy of the communication methods that we have these days. I think also, back then, so for first um, century Christians, they would have in mind, uh, especially Jewish Christians, uh, the fact that God had not spoken to them. The canon had closed several hundred years before uh, the time of Christ. And so to have not only the Word made flesh and dwelling amongst them, but then this record, these letters that were developing right before them, they'd hear from the great apostles and get instruction on daily living, and they were eagerly anticipated. So perhaps that have that in mind the next time you're reading an epistle. Well, what is an epistle? An epistle is simply a letter, nothing fancy about that. They're only found, interestingly, in the New Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament. 21 of them are epistles. So they take up a good portion of our New Testament Bible, starting from Romans and working all the way through to Jude. 13 are assumed to be written by Paul. The balance, of course, would be uh, written by James and John and Peter and Jude. Hebrews is unattributed. We really don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Well, what are they about? Well, Paul's epistles alone were written over a period of about 15 years. 15 years. And so you can imagine over 15 years, the topics vary greatly, starting from, we believe, First and Second Thessalonians, and then working through to the end of Paul's life in the mid to late 60s. Two styles present themselves, theological letters or occasional letters, theological or occasional. For theological, think of books like the Book of Romans or Hebrews, 
well, what's an occasional letter? Well, my mom used to write fantastic letters. She would write letters to our family, and she was a really good writer. Sometimes she would include little games and puzzles for the kids, like she'd make up her own connect the dots, and the kids would dutifully you know, follow the numbers, connect the dots, and out would come this great picture. And uh, like I said, she was a very good writer as well. Well, her letters were typically occasional, and by that I mean she would be responding to certain occasions, birthdays, holidays, perhaps something that she had done she wanted to relate to us. That's an occasional letter. Well, New Testament letters or epistles are also occasional. Uh, they're occasional in that, not that they're marking holidays or, or birthdays, but they are marking um, different types of occasions like questions that had been submitted to Paul. It could be uh, certain situations that had arisen in the church that Paul is responding to. Think of, for instance, the Corinthians. They submitted questions clearly to Paul and he gives them answers back. Uh, Philemon focus on the question of forgiveness because of a situation that had happened in that church. Uh, Galatians and Colossians serve as responses to false teaching. Ephesians is this short but rich theological letter that has an emphasis, of course, on God's grace, but also living in harmony within Christian community. First Peter is a letter of encouragement to suffering churches. Many are written to churches, sometimes specific churches like the Colossians, the Ephesians, those are the churches at Colossae and Ephesus, but also sometimes to uh, churches in general, all churches. Also, occasionally they were written to individuals. Think of the pastoral epistles written to Timothy, First and Second Timothy or Titus. There, the instructions are given to younger pastors or to the general organization that Paul expects in a church. All of these things uh, show um, God's care for the church in giving us uh, instructions. We sometimes wonder, well, why would we, why would we need to have epistles? Why is the New Testament so replete with epistles rather than um, doctrinal teaching or even the Gospels? Why do we need something be some, beyond the Gospels? Well, as wonderful as the Gospels are, that's of course the account of the birth and the death and the resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said there would be a time when we would need. Uh, a comforter that we would need an instructor in John chapter 14 these are the words of Christ himself all this I've spoken while still with you but the advocate the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you well this is where our doctrine of Scripture comes in because it's God breathed God breathe. Their scriptures God breathe, as said in 2 Timothy 3.16, and it's profitable then for teaching and training, for rebuke and, and correction. It's written by men, but inspired by the Spirit. And we no longer have Jesus walking amongst us. We don't have his direct prophetic uh, utterances. We don't have his direct teaching and training. And yet we do have the words written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to tell us how to take those that example of Christ and his gospel and apply it to our daily lives. And that's what our epistles are. Very practical teaching, also embedded, though, in this rich theological teaching. Well, how are they structured? I want to, before we look at the book of Colossians, I do want to talk about how epistles are generally structured. And that's why I'm sitting today in one of our Sunday school rooms. I've got a whiteboard handy. It's amazing how typically structured these epistles are. Basically, all epistles have the following structure. An opening, a body, and a closing. An opening, a body, and a closing. And these parts also have subparts. Very typical structures include, for instance, 
a statement that it's from somebody, it's from somebody, and it's to somebody. Very simple. It's also a greeting and a giving of thanks. We'll walk through an example of this shortly. The body, sometimes we talk about uh, indicatives and imperatives. Indicatives and imperatives. Well, that's essentially the theological part, TH for theology, and the ethical, ETH, the ethical part of the letter. But I would add to that even before that, generally there's a, a like a thesis, a thesis statement of some sort. In the closing, we've got, you know, Paul will cover practical matters, another greeting, that's a personal greeting of some sort, and then a final grace that is given. Almost like a benediction to a service. He often gives these final graces or something that's doxological, worshipful. Let's just walk through an example of this. Take, for instance, 1 Corinthians, if you could open up, if you've got your scriptures there. Otherwise, just follow. 1 Corinthians uh, verse 1 says, Paul called by the will of God to be an, an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. So, Two people identified there in terms of the from, from Paul. Who is it to? Well, we find that in verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth. So we have a from and a to. Simple as that. In terms of um, the greeting, we move to uh, verse 3. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Simple, straightforward greeting. Now, the church in Corinth, we know, is a church that's riddled with problems. Yeah, there are a number of questions that they sent and a number of problems that Paul addresses. It's a long letter. Even to that church, he's got things for which he's thankful for. And he states this in verse 4. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Jesus Christ. That in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. And he goes on. A very rich blessing and thanksgiving given in spite of the problems that he has. It's very typical for Paul. Now the body, where is the... This is quite messy, isn't it? Uh, so I said there's theology and ethics. So the, what has God done for us? What do we do for God, given what God has done for us? Well, before that is some kind of thesis statement or an exhortation. And, and we can find that in verse, I don't have my glasses, but I believe around verse 10. It's an appeal, and it's an appeal to the divisions that are in the church. And so Paul is then going to exhort them. This is going to sort of shape where the letter is going. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and of the same judgment. Can you see how that's this exhortation? And, and we know that as he gets further on in Paul, he talks about the divisions, specifically divisions uh, around personalities. There are later on lawsuits even in the church, and he addresses that. And we go on then, uh, this uh, theology and ethics that works its way through the letter. Some of the shorter letters, it's very distinct. You get the theology up front, all of the ethics at the back end. Uh, 1 Corinthians is a little different because of its length and because of the number of problems and the number of questions Paul addresses. He kind of, he does front end a bit of his theology in the first four chapters, and then it's really interlacing. It's, it's dealing with a problem with, there's a theology behind that and then a practical outworking. So that's the general structure, as messy as that looks. Let's, uh, let's turn to Colossians. This is really a book 
that I want to spend a little bit of time on over the next few Tuesdays. So it's a wonderful book, and I think it's a book that does pertain to us at this time. We'll take a few minutes today just to see how this lines up with Paul's structure, and then we'll get into the meat of it every week. I want to take a few, uh, few verses of the text and have a devotional moment with you on that, and I think we'll be encouraged by it. Well, what is Colossae? <clears throat> well, you can imagine, if you can imagine, a fertile valley. It's got a river going through it, meandering through it. It's in an area uh, roughly where Turkey is today. On the shores of that river, there's a junction of two important uh, roads. Uh, it stands uh, not far from uh, the towns of Laodicea and Heropolis. These are two cities that are, frankly, more important than Colossae at this time. They already have churches established in them, and they are, you know, 10 or 12 miles away. Colossae sits uh, at this fork of uh, not only the rivers and these, this confluence of rivers and, and uh, roads. It's a mixed town in that it's mixed in its ethnicity and its religious practice as well. You could stroll the streets and find marketplaces. You'll encounter there a mix of, like I said, religious beliefs and ethnicity. Jews and Greeks both would live there, as well as a variety of other races, cults, and religious uh, philosophies. Among the various subcultures, there's one that identifies itself as Christian. Paul is not the one who started the church here. That's We'll find that out as we go through the letter. Epaphras is the gentleman that, that established the church, but Paul is writing to them. We find that. I better turn there. Let's see how this lines up with our structure that we've already identified. In verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Can you see the pattern? We see Paul identified as well as Timothy, his brother, as being uh, the senders of this letter. The recipients are the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. He says grace to them and peace from God our Father. So there's his, his greeting. His thanksgiving comes next. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. So there we have an example of a very classic opening from Paul. In his body, his exhortation uh, comes really from about verse, I'd say about verse 9. And he says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, why is that important? It seems like he's identified three things, knowledge, spiritual wisdom, and understanding. Well, as we go further on in this letter, we're going to find that the primary reason that Paul is writing is to contradict uh, bad teaching, false teaching. And so he's laying out, he's exhorting them toward um, proper teaching. He wants them to have proper spiritual understanding, uh, the knowledge of God's will. And that's going to come primarily through driving them back to Jesus Christ. And this is where we get his thesis statement, and that's in the preeminence of Christ. Starting from verse 15, he has this amazing um, discourse, really, on a, a teaching or a some people say it's even, there's a hymn that this would relate to. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So Paul is laying out an exhortation. This is what I desire for you. I want you to be filled with the knowledge of his will. I want you to grow in spiritual understanding. But he's also very clear in stating that it's not going to be where you have been tempted to find 
it's going to be in Christ. Christ is the head of our church. Christ is the head of your church. And he's talking then in some of the loftiest language that we have for Jesus Christ in the New Testament. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth. Well, that's all I have time for today. Um, where we're going to find why I chose Colossians. One, it's a short book. We can get through it in four chapters. I encourage you to read it this week. You know, going back to my mom, when I received a letter from her, or even a letter from Linda or Linda from me, we wouldn't read that one sentence at a time and then keep the letter for the next day, read another sentence, read another sentence, read, read the whole letter. So I encourage you when you, especially these shorter epistles, if that's the part of your Bible reading section that you're on, and it may take you, you know, a week to get through that, whatever pace you're going through it, at some point in that time that you're in, say the book of Colossians, read it through front to back. When that letter was sent, it was sent by a messenger, probably on foot, received by a church, perhaps a house church, they would have had such anticipation for that letter. This is the great apostle. He's either answering a question or he's going to teach us something, teach us something that he feels is really important for us to anchor ourselves and grow in our faith. And so they would have received that, gathered the church, and they would have read it front to back. So if we are going to have the ears of the original hearers, and hopefully then not just hearers only, but doers of the word, I really encourage you to read the letter as it's written, front to back, at least once. And then by all means, do your study. Do that line-by-line -line study. And we'll do some of that line-by-line -line study over the next few weeks of the book of Colossians. And I trust you'll be really encouraged by it. Thanks for listening today. See you next week.